This is the first Kia model built on an all-new electric car platform shared with Hyundai and Genesis. This electric car platform was designed from the ground up to support electrification on a wide variety of different vehicle sizes and styles. This platform is going to spawn electric vehicles like this EV6 that's a compact crossover about the same size on the outside as the upcoming Kia Sportage on up to the new EV9, the hotly anticipated three-row electric crossover coming very soon from Kia. At the moment, the EV6 comes only in two flavors, wind and GT line. A little bit later this year, they're going to be joined by a new light trim that's going to give you 232 miles of range and 167 horsepower. The GT line trim and the wind trim get the same power figures and same range figures up to 310 miles of range. Then a little bit later, we're going to be seeing the new GT trim, not to be confused with the GT line trim. That's going to give you 576 horsepower. If you aren't a regular subscriber, you might not know that this blue GT line trim is actually my EV6. I was so impressed by the EV6 when I first drove this at the launch event that we sold our Mach-E and we bought an EV6 to replace it. Now, whether I will keep this long-term or whether I'll keep this for about the same time that we kept the Mach-E for long-term testing, honestly, I don't know just yet, but I have to say the EV6 is quite impressive. As you might expect, the styling on the GT line is a little bit more aggressive. The grill elements below are a bit more horizontal. We have the same sort of imitation grill between the headlights. The headlights themselves are actually the same, but you can see that we have more of a horizontal theme over here on the GT line in blue and more of a vertical theme to the grill elements over here in the wind trim. The lower portion of the bumper in the GT line trim sticks out a little bit more, so if you're worried about hitting curbs, keep that in mind. The wind trim does have a bumper that's a little bit higher up front. But both of these front bumpers have elements that can be a little bit difficult to clean yourself if you want to wash your own car. The little tabs over here in the GT line trim, it is kind of tricky to really clean in there, as are the vertical sections over there on the wind trim. And this very 3D headlight design, you can see actually how far my hand goes in that section right there. That also can be a little bit tricky to clean, as are these really interesting 3D elements on that faux grill section. If you didn't already know it, this Kia and the Hyundai Ioniq 5 are closely related, but the two vehicles are styled completely differently. The Ioniq is very boxy and upright. This is a little bit more laid back and definitely more swoopy. Now that does reduce interior practicality just a little bit in the rear seat area and in the cargo area. Now at 184.3 inches long, this is about three inches shorter than the elephant in the room, which is the Tesla Model Y. That's the best selling electric crossover in America and one inch shorter than the second best seller, which is the Mustang Mach-E. But unlike the Model Y and the Mach-E, this definitely has more of a sport back, lift back, sports car vibe going on. And that is absolutely what Kia was going for. If you get the wind trim, then we get these blacked out wheel wells here with a bit of a texture to them. If you're not a fan of black body cladding, you're going to want the GT line trim. It's a little bit difficult to see on this dark blue paint job, but the wheel arches, those are body color, as is this lower section of the body here under the doors. There is still a black trim strip that runs the length of the vehicle from one wheel arch to the other, but it's a lot more demure than the black parts that we find on the wind. The other reason to get the GT line trim are the wheels and the tires. I find this wheel design a little bit more attractive and they're wider wheels because we get 255 with tires front and rear on the GT line all wheel drive. Now, if we get the GT Line rear wheel drive, then we get 235 width tires, and those are the only width tire you'll find on the wind trim, whether you choose rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. One odd twist is that even though both models have front parking sensors, only the GT Line gets the side parking sensors to enable autonomous parking. And if you want a 360 degree camera system, you're going to find that only in the GT Line model. The most dramatic styling element for the EV6 has to be the tail lamp array, which starts on the side of the vehicle right by the wheel arch, then wraps around to the back and then all the way across to the other wheel arch on the other side. From the rear, we get a little bit more of an oval theme. It's completed by this satin chrome element that wraps up to meet the tail lamp module. Kia hides the charge door right over here on one side. It is a powered charge door. Then at the bottom, you notice that there's a little bit less body cladding going on over there on the GT line. Here we have the black element that wraps up to there, including this area right there around the license plate element. In this model, we get in the GT line, we get more of a multi-module affair going on integrated right there into the rear diffuser. Also a little bit different in the GT line, we get smoked chrome rather than satin chrome for the accents. 
As you'd expect in a modern EV, there's a ton of active driver assistance tech standard on the EV6, adaptive cruise control, autonomous emergency braking, pedestrian cyclist detection, lane keeping, lane centering, blind spot monitoring, and rear cross traffic detection. But there is still a reasonable amount of optional feature content as well. The parking sensors, the autonomous parking system, evasive steering assistant, and machine learning for the adaptive cruise control. One interesting twist, there is no hands-free driving system available on the EV6 or so far announced that it might be coming later. Instead, Kia gives us the latest version of their Highway Driving Assist System, HDA2. This is a hands-on-the-wheel system, but it does have automated lane changes. So in that respect, it is actually quite similar to Tesla Autopilot because that is also a hands-on-the-wheel steering assist system. But this is not like Cadillac Super Cruise or the Ford Blue Cruise system that you will find in some of the competition. Now let's get to the nuts and bolts. Kia designed the EV6 around three different battery packs. Two of those packs are coming to the United States. The base 58 kilowatt hour battery pack in the light trim, again, that's gonna be late availability, that will give you 232 miles of range and rear wheel drive with the less powerful electric motor. Then we get the 77.4 kilowatt hour battery pack you're gonna find in every other EV6, including the upcoming EV6 GT. At the moment, that's going to give you 310 miles of range. If you choose the 225 horsepower rear wheel drive model, that is this off-white model right next to me, or 274 miles of range if you get the all-wheel drive dual motor version, which is the blue one right behind me. Interesting twist, if you get the wind trim with the dual motor setup, the range is still 274 miles, even though this gets skinnier tires. 235 with tires on this one, 255 with tires on that one. Like the Taycan, the Lucid Air, and a number of upcoming Audi models, this is a full 800 volt EV. And I say full 800 volt because there is a bit of a distinction currently. The General Motors Ultium products at the moment are based around a 400 volt architecture, but they do some tricks with the battery pack to allow you to charge it at an 800 volt station. For me at least, front trunks are nice to have, not a must have. If you must have one, you must shop somewhere else because the EV6 doesn't really have one. It has a sort of a small pizza box area here where you can put things like your charge cable or the vehicle to load connector that the vehicle comes with. Although you should know that the vehicle does not come with a level two or a level one EVSE. You have to buy your own. Kia said that in their research, a high percentage of EV intenders already have an EVSC from a previous plug-in hybrid or an electric vehicle, but to be perfectly honest, the main reason Kia didn't include it is probably cost cutting. One thing I'm glad Kia did not cost cut away is this nifty little adapter here. This is the vehicle to load adapter that's standard on GT line and this wind trim here. It allows you to pull 1.8 kW off the onboard inverter. There are two ways to access that 1800 watts. There's one outlet right there just under the rear bench seat, or you pop open the charge door and plug in the included adapter. We then press the power button on the end, the green light illuminates, and the dashboard lets you know that something is plugged into that outlet. In the infotainment system, you can then tell the car how low you want the battery to go before it turns it off. 1800 watts isn't a huge amount, but it is enough that you can whip out a level one EVSE and help fuel up your buddy's car. You can see that this is charging because that little charge light is blinking over there on this blue EV. And then the charge light is blinking over here on the white EV because this one is supplying power. It's letting you know how much of your battery is left. 1800 watts isn't as much as an F-150 Lightning can produce, but it is sufficient to run a microwave, a refrigerator, things like that, or even power tools like this pancake air compressor. Over the month and a half that I've been driving my EV6 and the week that I've had this model, I found front seat comfort to be excellent. The driver and front passenger seats are essentially identical. They have the same range of motion. The seat bottom cushion adjusts for tilt, something that we don't find on the Mach-E for some reason. And we have a two-way lumbar support. I do wish this had a four-way lumbar because we do find that in some EVs, depending on exactly what you want to compare the EV6 to. The driver's seat has a two-position memory over there on the door and additional memory settings basically available via the driver profiles in the infotainment system. We have a four-way adjustable steering column with definitely a decent range of motion. But one key thing to keep in mind, if you're wondering about a sunroof and you're taller, just don't do it. You lose about two inches of headroom, which is a very significant loss in the EV6. It actually puts front seat headroom behind rear seat headroom. The reason for that is that this is one of the few EVs that has a sunroof that opens. And I have to admit, I was really, really torn about that myself. In my EV6, I have to sit in a slightly more reclined position because there just isn't as much headroom there, but I really love the fact that the sheet of glass actually opens. I was really torn about it. I decided to go for the sunroof and I'm not sorry about it, but if you're taller than I am, you might be. 
Thanks to the long wheelbase and the short nose, there is a ton of legroom in the EV6. Now on your chart, it may appear that the Mach-E has more room on the inside. There are different ways of measuring legroom and I suspect Ford is using a different legroom measurement method than Kia is. That has been something Ford has been accused of in the past. But in real world situations, you can see this front seat's adjusted for me at six feet tall. I have about 18 inches of legroom left. We have a completely flat load floor, just as you'd expect in an EV. Plenty of headroom back here. If I move to the middle seat position, I still have uh, maybe about a quarter inch of headroom left when my head is all the way back there to the headrest. All the way over on this side, putting my head back there to the headrest, my hair is pretty close to the ceiling, but not quite touching it. And I have about maybe about four inches of legroom left. This front seat track is pretty long, though. It moves quite far rearward compared to the Mach-E. So if you're a taller driver or if you have longer legs, this is probably going to be quite comfortable. But you might want to take a look at the Ionic 5 because the ceiling is a little bit higher. And again, be sure and skip that moonroof. Now, speaking of ceiling dimensions, if I scoot back over here to this side, because the greenhouse really curves in there to give it that strong shoulder profile on the outside, you will notice that this portion of the roof is a lot closer to my head than it is in the Ionic 5. As always, there's a practical downside to a sleek and sexy roof line, and that is cargo practicality. 24.4 cubic feet of cargo space is what we find behind the rear hatch. There's about one cubic foot under the hood in that little tiny pizza box area. That's as compared to 30 cubic feet approximately behind the Model Y's second row seats and the Mach-E's second row seats, plus about four to five cubic feet under their front trunk versus the other crossover in Kia's lineup that's around this same size on the outside, the new Kia Sportage, you'll find 39 cubic feet in that model, but you won't find the slinky profile that we have in this model, and you won't find a rear hatch that is this steeply raked. Under the load floor, there's a bit of additional storage space. This is where we find the tire mobility kit. We also have the vehicle to load connector right there in that little box. If you want to, you can move this load floor into that position so that we can sort of divide your cargo, have easier access to it, or you can completely remove it from the vehicle for the maximum in storage ability. There's a roller style cargo cover available from your dealer, but it's not standard on the EV6. Kia did, however, plan for that roller cargo cover, and there's a way to store it right there under the load floor. Now let's go for a quick spin around the interior. Again, this model does not have any panoramic moonroof, but we still have height adjustable shoulder belts and four-way adjustable headrests. The headrests have a rather eccentric design to them. It kind of reminds me of a bell on a musical instrument there. They're a ratchet style headrest. So if I push forward, you can see that ratchets for that direction and then it rises up and down as a normal headrest. The seat back here, that's a hard plastic. We have USB charge ports on either side there, USB-C, and as you can see, there are SRS airbags inside. The seats are perforated because these seats are both heated and ventilated. There's a reasonable amount of soft touch material going on inside. This has a two-tone color scheme, or I guess you might say three-tone, because the trim over here on the dashboard has an interesting texture to it. It looks like it's fabric, but it's actually not fabric. It's a soft touch injection molded plastic like we find in the rest of the interior. Lots of horizontal lines on this interior, giving it definitely a distinctive look, but we don't find the sort of diffuse air vents that we find in other new Hyundai and Kia products. One thing that we do find standard, however, is this large dual 12.3 inch LCD instrument cluster and infotainment system. This one is a touchscreen. It features smartphone integration that does support full screen smartphone integration in case you're wondering. And this has the latest software from Kia. I'll go into this in greater detail in a separate video, but one thing that you should know is that the mapping interface for this vehicle does not automatically plan charging sessions like we do find in the Mach-E. I initially was a little bit worried about that, but after having spent a month and a half in my EV6 and of course a year in the Mach-E, I realized I never actually used the Mach-E's route planning system. I was happy that it had it, but I always ended up using either other interfaces, usually CarPlay for finding out where I was going and I planned my own charging stops. Um, but if that's something that you're interested in and you want the ease of that, then keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is that we have this interesting touchscreen arrangement for buttons down here. This operates as the infotainment system controls and the climate controls. You swap between options with this button here and then this touch display right across there changes function as do the knobs. So in this mode, this is a volume and power knob and that's a tune knob. And then in this mode, those are climate control knobs. I've gotten used to it, but I have to say, I wish there was a dedicated row of buttons for either function rather than swapping back and forth. Below that, we have physical buttons for the ventilated seats and heated seats. Power button right there. Rotary style shifter, drive over there, reverse over to that side, park right there in the middle. Behind that, we have the button for the camera system. This doesn't have a 360 camera, so we just get the backup camera there. Auto brake hold, parking sensors, 
two cup holders, a large Qi wireless charging mat, that's definitely a nice touch there, and then a padded center armrest that opens to reveal a moderately sized storage compartment. Under the center console, we find two USB inputs, a large storage area there with a 12 volt charging mat. And you can see that we do have a flat load floor, but we do have a small bump out right there for that module with those USB ports. As we've seen in other Kia models, we have an absolutely enormous glove compartment in the dashboard. You could very easily fit large tablet computers like 14 inch tablet computers there inside, plenty of room, and it's a combination bin and slot style glove compartment. The LCD instrument cluster on the driver's side is definitely a distinctive feature. It gives us a very Mercedes vibe on the inside. It has a few different layouts, but the information is not too adjustable. It's basically your trip computer information and some active safety readouts. We then have a very distinctive two-spoke round steering wheel here. It's a two-tone design with this attractive light gray and then the lighter section there in the middle. As far as color preferences go, I really like this particular interior color because of this light rather than charcoal gray and then the lighter section in the middle. We have, again, the satin chrome strip mirroring what was going on outside. These buttons control that multifunction LCD cluster right there and the radar adaptive cruise control system with the aggressive lane keeping assistance. And then over here we have buttons for the infotainment system. Moving over into the GT line trim, you can see that we have a pretty standard sized moonroof and it does open right there basically the same sort of headrest design. This interior is available in a variety of different tones and there's a imitation leather or an imitation suede seat option. So this has the imitation suede option. I'm curious to see how well these wear over time. The middle sections are perforated because this is still ventilated, but moving over to the doors, you notice the other big change, we get more ambient lighting in here and a very distinctive ambient light strip right across the dashboard. Also, different textures and different materials on the dashboard with more of a futuristic pattern there. This ambient lighting strip is color adjustable in the infotainment system. Again, the same sort of button bank there, same infotainment software, but oddly enough, touch buttons for the ventilated seats and heated seats and heated steering wheel rather than the physical buttons. I have to say, I kind of prefer the physical button because I did notice that occasionally I tend to rest my wrist here or hand here as I'm trying to stab an option, and then I found myself turning on or off the heated or ventilated seats. We have basically the same shifter here, plenty of glossy plastic there. This button activates the 360 degree camera system, which is a feature I love. That one's available only on this model, as is the heads-up display over here for the driver's side. For some reason, heads-up displays are something that we don't find on a reasonable number of the EV competition. Now, the steering wheel is a little bit different. We get, instead of the two-tone arrangement, a single-tone steering wheel with a slight flat bottom. The ambient lighting doesn't just include the dashboard, it also includes the bottom of the center console. It's a really attractive touch at night. One thing I have to say though, I think it's a pity that this USB connector isn't in the center console because this whole cable thing, that's a little distracting. Get the EV6 out on the road, and this is definitely not going to feel like an ID4, a BZ4X, or a Subaru Solterra. This is really going to feel more like a luxury performance EV, to be perfectly honest. And this certainly has the specs to back it up. In our testing, 0 to 60 in the dual motor version happened in 4.4 seconds. If you choose the rear wheel drive model, which is the one that I'm driving right here, then 0 to 60 stretches out a touch to 6.7 seconds, but that is still entirely respectable. One interesting twist with the dual motor version of the EV6 is that if you choose eco mode from this little push button on the steering wheel, then it's going to disable the front electric motor and zero to 60 times are going to stretch out. But there's a little bit of a twist. I'd actually expected that mode to be a little bit slower than this rear wheel drive mode, but in that mode, my dual motor model clocked 0 to 60 in 6.5 seconds, and here's why. It doesn't actually completely disable the front electric motor. Instead, what Kia does is it uses it for initial launch, that way you still have that traction for all-wheel drive, and then once you hit about five or six miles an hour, then it completely disconnects the front electric motor. The net result is you actually get slightly better 0 to 60 times, even in eco mode, than you get in the single motor model. In my 60 to 0 stopping tests, the model with the wider tires, that would be the GT line trim, managed the task in 117 feet. It took this model 129 feet. If you're looking for the best handling in the EV6 lineup, and honestly, very impressive handling period for a modern EV, then you're going to want the dual motor GT line version, because that's the one that gets you the wide tires. But even this rear wheel drive wind trim, this is a ton of fun to drive. 
One of the more surprising things about the EV6 is that Kia did not follow everybody else down the rabbit hole of designing the suspension to feel exactly like a Tesla suspension setup. So this is not firm and bouncy like we find in the Model 3 or the Model Y or the Mach-E or insert a lot of your big battery EVs right there into that statement. Instead, this feels much more like a traditional crossover, albeit a heavy one, and that actually gives it a very nice ride quality. This bounds over those larger imperfections fairly well, even though we're riding on 20 inch tires. This is not an adaptive suspension system like we should be finding in the GT version. Instead, this is a regular hydraulic damper with two valves in it. Honda has also used this suspension type in a number of Honda and Acura models because it gives a really nice ride quality. Back out on the paved road, the EV6 is just so much fun. Whether we're talking about the rear wheel drive model or the all wheel drive model, because Kia did not choose to use a symmetric motor layout in this vehicle like we find in a Volvo or in a Subaru or the Toyota EV. Instead, the rear electric motor is about twice as powerful as the front electric motor, meaning that even if you get the all-wheel drive model, this has a strong rear power bias. In my cabin noise testing at 50 miles an hour, I measured 70 decibels in here, making this definitely on the quieter side for a compact crossover and right in line with a reasonable number of EVs. The benefit for a lot of electric vehicles when it comes to cabin noise is that there's a big battery pack between the road and me, and that really helps reduce road noise. Although I haven't been able to test it, expect the absolute base version of the EV6 to be a little bit louder out on the open highway because it doesn't get acoustic laminated side glass. It just has an acoustic laminated windshield. Also surprising, I didn't notice any difference in cabin noise between this model with the 235 width tires and the GT line with 255 width tires. They both came in right at 70 decibels. Bottom line, out on the road, the EV6 is an immensely impressive vehicle, and it probably shouldn't be a surprise because Kia and their parent company, Hyundai, have been hiring a ton of German engineers away from companies like Audi and BMW and Mercedes, etc. And that's probably why this honestly feels kind of like you'd imagine a rear wheel drive German vehicle might feel, one that was tuned towards the slightly softer, more comfortable side of things, but definitely with an eye on handling. This doesn't really come across like a Polestar 2. This is definitely softer and more comfortable than a Polestar 2, but honestly, this handles just about as well as one. Before we talk about pricing, let's talk about range and efficiency. Both are excellent in the EV6, but you should know that the heat pump again is only available in the all-wheel drive model. Let's talk about the effect that that makes on the EV6's range. Fortunately, the week that I had the EV6, it averaged about 70 degrees during the day for the first few days. Then we had a cold snap that took the temperatures down to the low 30s. Taking full advantage of this situation, I was able to do a number of identical journeys back to back where I was driving one EV6, someone else was driving the other EV6. Remember these two EV6s, one has the heat pump and one does not. Let's talk about the results here. So on a round trip trip, my daily commute, 60 miles, we just made a loop there, up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass, the rear wheel drive model at 70 degrees Fahrenheit averaged four miles per kilowatt hour. That's pretty close to the EPA rating, really fulfilling that over 300 miles of theoretical real world range. The all wheel drive model averaged about 3.6 miles per kilowatt hour, definitely very close to its real world range in the normal mode. Now let's talk about that for just a moment here. In eco mode, it's again going to disconnect the front axle pretty regularly in order to improve fuel economy. And that did have a surprisingly noticeable improvement on economy. On the exact same trip, we managed 3.8 miles per kilowatt hour in eco mode. Now, to verify that we were driving appropriately, we actually did a loop with the EV6 rear wheel drive and all wheel drive together in normal mode and then together with the EV6 all wheel drive in eco mode. Now, what happens when temperatures drop? So setting the cabin to 72 degrees Fahrenheit with an ambient temperature of 34 degrees Fahrenheit on the outside, the rear wheel drive models range dropped noticeably. It ended up at 3.2 miles per kilowatt hour. And on this drive loop, which we ended up doing twice because we wanted to be sure about these numbers, the all wheel drive model averaged 3.4 miles per kilowatt hour. This really shows the effect and the benefit of a heat pump system in a modern electric vehicle. Now, if you're worried about really low temperature performance, I have been able to confirm that the EV6 still has a resistive element heater as a backup. It doesn't appear to be the same resistive element heater we find in the non-heat pump model, but it is there as a backup in case temperatures drop really low. With that out of the way, let's dive into the pricing and availability. Now, let's talk about availability first. In 2021, Kia made 104,000 EVs globally. In 2022, apparently that's going to ramp up to 162,000 EVs by the end of the year. And by 2020, 
2026, they're claiming 579,000 EVs globally. Now, we don't know how many of those EVs are coming to the United States, and that is a problem when it comes to EV6 availability. We just don't know how many Kia is actually planning on shipping here. However, we do know that Kia is planning a ton of new EV models in the United States. They're going to be sold in all 50 states, and the Nero EV is coming back to the U.S. in its new generation. So if you were worried that that might be sailing off into the sunset, fear not, it's coming back, and it's likely going to be less expensive than the EV6. It should at the very least help take pressure off of EV6 inventories because there's going to be another EV option on Kia dealer lots. Now, obviously, markups are something we need to cover as well. Markups can be pretty extreme on the EV6. I have seen reports of markups of up to $10,000 on EV6s and apparently buyers that are willing to pay that kind of markup on their brand new Kia EV. Now, personally, I am not among those people. I would not buy an EV for a markup at all. I will pay MSRP. I refuse to pay a markup. And if you refuse to pay a markup as well, then I would say just hunt for a different dealer. There is an EV markup tracker tool. I will post the link down there in the description section of this video. It's a Google Data Studio document, and that will actually help direct you to dealers that are not charging markups. There are dealers in every state in the US that have pledged not to charge a markup, and they have been confirmed by customers out there. So this is really the way that we're gonna combat markups uh, in anything really, is if you are willing to let your fingers do the walk and you are willing to go to a different dealer and use them and tell them that you're buying the vehicle through them because they're not charging a markup, perhaps things might get a little bit better. Now, on an EV6, I might be prepared to pay maybe a minor markup, maybe $500 to $1,000. That's not too bad, but $5,000, $10,000, absolutely not. I simply wouldn't do it. And that brings us along to the pricing. The EV6 starts at $40,900 for 2022. Now that is the new light trim. At the moment, you're probably not gonna find one on the dealer lots. At the moment, the base trim is probably gonna be the wind trim that we were driving in this video, $47,000 for the rear wheel drive model of that one. That's gonna get you over 300 miles of range. It's gonna get you the bigger battery pack versus the base model, power lift gate, the vehicle to load functionality, acoustic side glass, power passenger seat, the Meridian audio system, and rear parking sensors. If you want all-wheel drive, the least expensive way to do that is also in the wind trim. That's going to set you back $50,900. If you want the GT line fully loaded, basically like the one that I got, that ends up at around $58,000 and change by the time you've added the floor mats, the cargo cover, and of course the $1,225 destination charge. Now let's run through the competition. The first competitor has to be Tesla, and the first model, I think, has to be the Model 3. The reason for that is that the EV6 comes across as a little bit more sporty, a little bit more maybe sedan or sportback like than a traditional crossover. It's not as boxy as the Ionic 5. It's definitely not as upright in terms of its seating position as the Model Y, but we'll get to the Model Y in a little bit. The big reason for the Model 3 comparison is its price tag. It has gotten considerably more expensive over time, but it starts right around the same price as the EV6. It's $46,990 as of the date that I'm recording this video. That's basically the same price as the rear wheel drive wind model starting that we tested. But what's more interesting here is that even discounting the tax credit, these two vehicles are very, very evenly matched. And this is one of the few vehicles that's pretty easy to say that about. We get about the same kind of legroom. We get relatively similar cargo room when you account for the front trunk up front versus the frunkless EV6. The EV6 does have a slight advantage there. And there are advantages on either side here. Let's run through them. The two vehicles are very similar in price before the tax credit. Performance is a little bit lower in the Kia. We're talking about the single motor versions here, of course. But range is better in the Kia, especially real world range. Now that said, of course, remember that the rear wheel drive versions of the EV6 do not have a heat pump. Charging is faster in the EV6 than it is in the Tesla. This is a really, really big win and an example of why the 800 volt architecture in the EV6 is so important. 18 minute charging from 10% to 80% is definitely very fast. And you will get that also in the base model of EV6. Now, that charging speed is dependent on a few different factors. If you're charging in colder weather, you can expect that to really stretch out because we do not have the ability to precondition the battery like we find in modern Teslas. In Teslas, you program the supercharger destination in there. It knows, hey, I'm going to supercharge, and it starts heating the battery up in advance. It looks like that feature is coming to the EV6, but at the moment, it is not on the EV6. So you program in a DC fast charging destination. The car doesn't know what's going on. It'll just drop down there to whatever charge range you end up with 
when you reach there, and the battery may or may not be warm enough to accept that charge quickly. There is, of course, some variation in Supercharger versus Electrify America experience, and Electrify America is the key here because they're the big elephant in the room with fast DC fast charging in the U.S. But honestly, locations around most of the U.S. are relatively similar as far as road tripping. Uh, the experience is definitely smoother on the Tesla side, but it is acceptable in getting better on the Electrify America side. The trade-off there, again, is the faster charging speed. Now, if you want an all-wheel drive version of the Model 3, that's going to be $55,900, so $5,000 more than the Kia, and of course, you're not going to get that federal tax credit. Next up, we have the Ford Mustang Mach-E, the third best-selling EV in America. Ford makes a wide variety of different trims. We have two different batteries to choose from, etc. So you can get range from 224 miles on up to 314 miles. There's, of course, the GT version and the GT Performance version as well. Outside of Tesla, I think Ford is really having the biggest impact on electrification in America right now. The Mach-E has done extremely well. Of course, there's certainly a little bit of Tesla going on here, to be perfectly honest, because it's clear that Ford really benchmarked Tesla models when designing the ride quality, the handling quality, etc. of the Mach-E, the way that it behaves out on the road. It is very Tesla-like with a few extra buttons, narrower tires, a bigger battery pack here and there, but definitely along that same line. Ford has also been very aggressive with their EV production targets. Initially, Ford said that they would be making about 50,000 Mach-E's a year, and now they're planning on building 250,000 Mach-E's a year starting sometime late next year. And on top of that, they're also going to be adding on additional full electric models like the hotly anticipated F-150 Lightning. Because Ford decided to use a 400-volt nominal system in the Mach-E, it's not going to charge as rapidly as the EV6. That is one big difference between these two vehicles. And it's something that I really noticed when driving the vehicles back-to-back. -back. The Mach-E is going to take a lot longer, so those road trips are definitely going to take longer. For the average driver, that's not going to be a huge deal. I think the bigger deal is going to be the handling ability and the ride quality that we find in the Mach-E. On the downside, the EV6 definitely has a smaller cargo area, and the rear seats, they're definitely not as comfortable. Now let's talk about the close cousin, the Ionic 5. Remember that when Hyundai and Kia are designing cars, they're not acting like 1980s General Motors. So these two vehicles are related, but they don't share too much directly outside of the motor, the battery pack, and some key internal software. For instance, the length of the vehicle and even the wheelbase are different between the Ionic 5 and the EV6 because of their different missions. The EV6, as a result of its tighter wheelbase, turns a little bit tighter, so it's going to be a little bit easier in urban situations. And the suspensions are definitely tuned differently. The Ionic 5 is a little bit more floaty boaty, a little bit more compliant. The EV6 is a little taut, but both vehicles have excellent ride quality and definitely above what we find in the Model Y, the Model 3, or the Ford Mustang Mach-E. I have to admit that I am personally torn between the very futuristic style of the EV6 and the sort of modern 1980s boxy style that we find in the Ionic 5. The Ionic 5's boxy style is definitely very practical. It has a bigger cargo area, it has more headroom and more shoulder room in the second row area. On paper, it may not look like a big deal, but in reality, the second row is definitely more comfortable for taller adults in the Ionic 5, just based on the way that the two vehicles are shaped. And of course, in the front, if you get the sunroof in the Ionic 5, you are going to get more headroom and you're going to be able to sit in a more upright seating position versus the EV6. Although the user interface software for the instrument cluster and the infotainment system is basically the same behind the skin, I prefer the styling of the Ionic 5 a little bit over what we see in the EV6. And as far as functionality goes, the Ionic 5 does have a separate row of buttons for the climate control and for the infotainment system that is certainly my preference. The look inside the Kia cabin definitely is a little bit cleaner, but it's a little bit less functional. Feature for feature, the two vehicles are honestly very close together, but you will notice that generally speaking, the Kia is going to be a little bit more expensive. That's the price you're going to have to pay for that uh, more style forward styling. Which of these vehicles is right for you will really depend on how much you like that style, to be honest, because the core of these vehicles is very similar. The battery warranty is the same, the regular warranty is the same, the electric motor unit, the batteries. All of that's the same, the DC fast charging experience, etc. As we often see with related models from Hyundai and Kia, both the EV6 and the Ionic 5 are absolutely excellent. And which one is right for you will really come down to how much you need that cargo area in the back and which style you prefer. Honestly, you couldn't go wrong with either one. Also, a can't-go-wrong-with option is the Volkswagen ID.4. Now, the ID.4 has had a bit of a bumpy road sales-wise because of some supply and production constraint issues in Germany, but the ID.4 is a solid, albeit perhaps a little boring, option. Boring, of course, sounds a little bit negative, but to be perfectly honest, I really appreciate and I agree with the production and design goals of the ID.4. You see, instead of creating a sexy, style-forward, fast, well-handling EV, 
Volkswagen decided to build an EV for the RAV4, the CRV, and the Tiguan shopper. And that makes a lot of sense because that is the biggest segment in America. So the entire mission of the ID4 is different than the mission of the EV6. It's not designed to go zero to 60 in four seconds. It's not designed to go zero to 60 in under three seconds or something like that. It's instead designed to go zero to 60 in six to seven seconds, pretty similar to your average mainstream crossover. It's designed to have a big cargo area in the back, over 30 cubic feet of space. It's designed to have a large and square and accommodating cabin, and that is exactly what it does very well. It also happens to be well-priced, especially if we're talking about the all-wheel drive model. It is no longer the least expensive all-wheel drive EV in America that is now the BZ4X, but it is still very inexpensive starting at 44910 so significantly less expensive than an EV6 all-wheel drive. Is it going to be as fun to drive as an EV6? No, but it is definitely less expensive. Depending on your situation, free DC fast charging might be more important than fast DC fast charging, if that makes sense. Bottom line, the EV6 is a very impressive electric vehicle, and that's exactly why I bought one just as soon as I could. I, again, was really torn between it and the Ionic 5, and to be honest, honest, my final decision came down to availability. It was more available in my area than the Ionic, but both of them are absolutely excellent options, and I would have zero problem recommending either of them. But to be honest, we have a number of really, really solid EVs in America right now. It's not possible to discount the Model Y or the Model 3, the EV6, the Ionic 5, or depending on your situation, the Mustang Mach-E. The Mach-E is very available. Ford is really making an effort with that vehicle. And although I like the EV6 and the Ionic 5 a bit more, I have to say Ford dealers generally don't seem to be charging the same kind of markups as long as you can find one on the dealer lot. Let me know what you think about all that down there. And what would your pick be if you were looking to shop uh, for about $55,000 or so? Would you be willing to get something like the EV6? Would you rather have an Ionic 5? Would you wait for a Mach-E or would you wait six months for perhaps a less expensive variant of the Tesla Model Y. Again, bear in mind that the Kia and the Hyundai are gonna have the $7,500 tax credit on them. The Tesla does not, and by the time you're gonna get your hands on a Mach-E, even if you could order one today, it's not gonna have that federal tax credit either because they've sold too many Mach-E's already. Let me know what you think about that. Find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you later.